pleasure for us today to have uh, Professor uh, Rafi Malach uh, give, uh, give the seminar. Uh, Professor Malach was um, born in Israel. He earned his, uh, his bachelor's in biology and master's in neurobiology here in the Hebrew uh, University. Uh, he received his PhD in physiological optics from the University of California at Berkeley. And uh, following a postdoc at MIT, he, uh, he joined uh, uh, the, Weizmann, uh, the Weizmann Institute. Uh, the Weizmann Institute is the head of the Department of Neurobiology and director of the Human Brain Imaging Center. Uh, Professor Malak's main interest concerns brain mechanisms underlying human visual perception and awareness. And towards this end, he employs functional brain imaging using magnetic resonance SMRI as well as intracranial electrophysiological recording. And today is a special day, to have, especially to have, uh, to have uh, Rafi since it w was the inauguration of our new, new fMRI, uh, new MRI uh, machine. And I'm sure we could use a lot of your advice. Thank you. OK, thanks for the invitation. Um, as you heard, I'm a graduate of the Hebrew University, so coming here is always some kind of a homecoming, uh, although I feel I disappoint the parents whenever I come sometimes, but uh, uh, this is okay. Um, I will uh, present, uh, part of my talk will be preliminary results that I'll be uh, happy to hear criticism as uh, negative as po as, and as critical as possible, because I figured it better that it will be destroyed here rather than being destroyed after we are trying to submit it. So some of the data will be really preliminary, but I'll be happy to hear comments. And of course, before I start, the most important people to acknowledge are the people who actually did the research, the students and the collaborators. I'll also mention their names as I go along. <coughs> uh, before I go to the actual uh, uh, experiments and results, uh, I want to briefly cover the methodology that we use. It was mentioned in the introduction and the way we look at it. And uh, basically we use three kinds of uh, techniques. We use two intracranial techniques, that is in patients undergoing clinical procedures for ep epileptic diagnosis. Uh, the neurosurgeon is doing this experiment, uh, this placement of the electrodes. We are not involved in that, but we take advantage of these electrodes when they are in place because the patients walk around with these electrodes chronically in their head, sometimes for a week, and when they are bored, uh, we can do a sort of ask them to participate in experiments. We use two methods, a single unit recording, mainly in enterorhinal cortex. I will not touch on it uh, uh, today, but, uh, you know, single unit recordings, we measure firing rates, and we use it as signals. The other type of intracranial invasive recordings is the called uh, electrocorticogram, ECOG. These are tiny electrodes at about one to three millimeters in size, size that are placed on the surface of the cortex, directly on the surface of the cortex of the patients, very extensively, as you can see, in many, many locations. And we collect from these signals the mass potential that you see here. And the, the parameter we focus on um, and it's becoming more sort of accepted over the years, is uh, these tiny oscillations, fast oscillations that are called gamma oscillations. What you see here is the simultaneous recording of single unit recording from a patient together with the local field potential, the signal that we are measuring with this technique. And you can see that whenever there are spikes, the line that uh, sort of is building the local field potential is become thicker become thicker, and this is because there are rapid oscillations that start whenever they are spiking in this vicinity of the electrode, and we measure those oscillations, we call them gamma, and we measure their amplitude, and this will be the second signal that we'll be collecting uh, when we are uh, trying to analyze signals from the cortex. We think, and there are several lines of evidence, that these gamma oscillations, the increase in amplitude of the gamma oscillations, is actually corresponds to the average increase in firing rate within the region of the electrode. So if we record from three millimeters, it's about 100,000 neurons, the average firing will be reflected in the increase in the gamma power 
of the signal that we are measuring. So when we, I'll be talking about ECOG... Your definition of gamma? Gamma is between 40 and 120, something like that. Um, now, uh, we take the whole, the whole broad range. Uh, so whenever I'll be talking about ECOG, I'll be talking actually about gamma frequencies. And the final signal that uh, most of the talk will be focused on is fMRI, bold signal. This is a hemodynamic signal, but it is coupled. We argued, and I think for a first approximation, the fMRI signal can be treated as if it is the average firing rate within the voxel, the volume element that we are measuring with MRI. Although it is hemodynamic, several studies, including ours in our lab, showed that there is a coupling between the magnitude of the bold signal and the firing rate of neurons within the image. As, as I said, it's first approximation. There is a huge debate how precise it is. But for our purposes, whenever I talk about signal of fMRI, I mean increasing firing of the neurons within the voxel. Of course, it is slow responses. The fMRI signal is sluggish. It takes seconds to develop. So we are smoothing. You conceptually should think about firing that is being smoothed by a filter of about four seconds when, we are, when you are looking at the fMRI response. So this is just a brief overview of how we look at the signals that we are measuring. Now, thinking about the visual system, people who are not deep in the research in this system tend to think about it as some kind of information processing system. The concept is that we have an outside stimulus, outside object, and then through the eyes, the visual system and the visual cortex is processing these optical signals in order to generate a model of what's happening outside in the world. So the, the thinking, prevailing thinking is that we, are, we should really think about the v optical signals as a critical parameter to study when we are studying the visual system. But of course, those of us who are really studying this system realize more and more that the critical parameter that must be considered when we are thinking about the visual system is not only the optical signals that come through the eyes, but the stored information, the a priori um, um, expectation, you might say, or a priori sensitivities of the visual system that exist in the brain, in the visual cortex, before we even look, before we even open our eyes. And a striking demonstration, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, of this kind of, up, the power of this a priori sensitivity bias expectation, you can call it any name you want, is uh, uh, depicted in this uh, famous uh, uh, illusion. It's in fact not illusion, it's a hallucination that you are having of a, of a triangle. And the reason you have this hallucination be is because in this particular instance of the triangle, your visual system, the a priori sensitivity that you have for triangles is so powerful that it overrides the visual signals that are in fact not a triangle, they are like these wedges, and the lines that you see of the triangle are driven by the a priori information that is stored in your brain. Your expectation to see a triangle is overriding the optical signal and creating a hallucination in your mind. That's the, the proper way of looking at it. So it's obvious that it is very, very important for us to understand what are these a priori information that is stored in our brain, in the visual system and the rest of the cortex, that is so powerful in driving and influencing our um, cognitive uh, abilities. Now, for more than 20 years, uh, our group and many, many other groups all over the world were studying fMRI in order to understand the functional specialization of different cortical regions. For example, in the visual system, the way you studied it, as you see in this example, you present different visual stimuli of different categories, and you measure the responses. In this case, it is fMRI. And you see the classic response, very fairly rapid. This is fMRI, so it's slow, but definitely a, a rapid and strong transient. And you see the functional selectivity. And we, in this way, Many, many groups are mapping the cortex very successfully and finding functional differences among different regions. The problem is, if we are now interested in understanding the a priori information, that this is not a proper uh, way to look at it because it combines both the optical signal that is coming from outside, these are the stimuli that you see here, 
and the a priori information. So what I'm wondering, what we were thinking, is there some way where we can sort of disentangle the optical stimulation from the a priori information? Is there a way to map the a priori information that sits in our brain and determines what we are sensitive to when we are looking around the world? And more recently, starting with the pioneering work of Amos Ariely, Misha Tzodik, and Amiram Greenwald at the Weizmann Institute in animals, anesthetized animals, and then following that, studies with fMRI by Biswall in the motor system, people started realizing, including in our own lab, that there's something very interesting that happens in the brain, not when we are stimulating it, but when you are letting people just relax and rest in the brain without doing anything. And it turns out that the brain, including the visual system, does not shut off and relax when you are closing your eyes and not seeing anything, but instead there is some interesting activity that happens as, as this happens. So in order to just give you a feel of this activity, what I want to show you now is a short uh, video that shows what happens under fMRI in the brain of one of the students that was asked to lie in the magnet, close their eyes, we darken the room, uh, you know, just relax and think whatever they, they want to think, but not necessarily be engaged in vivid visual imagery. And let's see what happens in the brain of such a subject as they lie in the magnet and try to be as relaxed as they can. The eyes are closed, the room is dark, and the person is not doing, not required to do anything. And now, what? Oh, I mean, there are many things. You can say things, or oh, what, what the hell am I doing here? And uh, of course, he's not dead. He's lying, he's resting. The magnet is making constant noise that is steady all the time. And, uh, and, there is, and with, in this condition, which we call resting state condition, I actually call it now spontaneous, and you'll understand later why. If you look at the brain, you see that there is a very interesting pattern that keeps going. It sweeps all over the brain. And if you look carefully, it's not random noise. This uh, pattern of activity that you see in yellow and orange is, if you look, it organizes. Sometimes you can see that it's very nicely um, mirror symmetric in the two hemispheres. It sweeps constantly over, all over the brain, the visual system, the frontal cortex. There is not a single voxel in the brain that does not go some kind of fluctuation, and it is very, very slow. Uh, the movie that I showed you was accelerated three times, so one wave like that typically takes 10 seconds. So we are talking about something very, very slow, yet it appears, even to the naked eye, to be organizing, to be telling us something interesting about the brain. And the question is, what is this signal telling us? Yes. Sorry. So the way to think about it is to equate it to visual activation. <coughs> we did this uh, uh, experiment in the visual system, and this, the typical signal depends on the magnet, techniques, and all that. The typical signal ranges between 1% and 3%. But when you record single unit in auditory cortex, for example, that reach 40 hertz, 50 hertz, it corresponds roughly to about 1% to 3%. So it's not... No, 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 no. Now, this is the absolute signal that you see in the ball. The, F, the uh, spontaneous fluctuations and the visual-driven signals will be both of roughly the same amplitude. Okay. So it's a very large signal. In fMRI, we can talk about it in terms of firing rate, it's a different thing, but in fMRI it's a very large signal, <coughs> but it is very slow. The difference from the task induced if the task is very rapid, can happen in 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, this takes seconds to develop. So the question is, does this pattern that seems very organized, very informative, very repetitive, does it tell us something about the brain? And the hypothesis that I want to discuss today is that this spontaneous pattern that you see is actually reflecting the a priori information of the cortex before you're starting the stimulus. And uh, this is the hypothesis. Uh, we don't have a full proof that this is correct, but I will talk about some results that seem to be compatible with this hypothesis. One now, question. is it reproducible in terms of the regions of the brain which is uh, activated? Of course. It's very reproducible. So the same pattern repeats itself many, yes. many times. Yes. 
many, many times. I'll show you, if we get to it, I'll show you some data. Um, A cross subject, will, this is a very interesting question. We'll talk about it. Now, why should, you would ask, why should spontaneous activity be related to this a priori information that I think is so important to understand about the, the human cortex? I would like to explain the way we think by using an extremely almost ridiculous toy model. It's, of course, not of the kind of model that modelists work, but conceptually, just to illustrate the way we are thinking. So it all starts with the Hebbian learning, and just to refresh your mind, I'm sure you all know it, the Hebbian learning rule is very, very simple. If two neurons happen to fire together, in other words, to fire in a correlated manner, after some of this firing happens, the synapse, synaptic connection between these two neurons will increase in strength. Okay, so whenever two neurons work together, fire together, we expect the connection between them to go up in its efficacy, in its ability of this neuron to activate the other one. And there is the complement of the Hebbian rule, which was not proposed by, by Hebb, but you, know, you, you can think about it as a sensible um, complement, and that is if two neurons are not correlated, or even if they are, maybe they are anti-correlated, so whenever this neuron is active, this neuron is suppressed, then the result of this dynamic is that the synaptic connection between them will go down, okay? This is the Hebbian learning rule of its two branches or two aspects. Now let's consider, uh, as I said, ridiculously simple model of a, of a triangle, detec triangle detector. Let's consider th four neurons of the Hubel and Wiesel type line detectors. <coughs> and as you can see, these three neurons form a shape of a triangle. And this neuron is an outlier, is not part of a triangle shape. Now, before training, let's say after birth or just by random connections, they have a sort of an average connectivity to this target neuron. This is pre-training. Now, let's assume that during life or by training or when a kid plays with a triangle, is exposed to many, many, many triangles. Now, these triangles, what will they do? They will activate together these three neurons because they belong to the shape of a triangle. As a result of their activation, they'll cross the threshold of activating this neuron so this neuron will start firing, and you can quickly see that they, because of a Hebbian relationship or learning rule, the connection between these, th these three neurons and the target neuron will be increased. Conversely, this neuron, which is, does not belong to a triangle, is dis decorrelated from the activity of this target neuron because this neuron is activated by these neurons and not by that one, so the synaptic connection between the outlier and the target neuron will be decreased. This is a very, very simple, basic uh, Hebbian learning group. One methodological question. Does this depend on where in the cortex it happens? They have to be neighbors? Or no, this is just a very, very abstract, simple model to explain where I'm, what is the basis of my claim that the spontaneous activity is related to a priori. So assume some kind of idealistic cortex. With, it doesn't matter if they're close or far. It's, it's very, very simple conceptual model. Now, so as a result of this training with the triangles, you'll see that these neurons will strengthen their sign up to the target neuron. So now, whenever the, these are stimulated, it will be activated. Furthermore, you don't, if they're sufficiently sensitive, you don't even need to show the entire triangle. It's enough that you show part of it, like in the Kanitsa triangle, and you'll cross the, the, the threshold and you'll get a response from these neurons. So you'll get this kind of hallucination triangle response. Basically, and this of course will not be the case when this neuron is activated because the synapse is uh, weak here, it will not activate the neuron. So basically, if you think about it, the a priori information, the sensitivity to the triangle is, is, is uh, built in into the synaptic connection. So the pattern of synaptic connection is telling you, is actually implementing the sensitivity, the a priori sensitivity of the cortex, in this case, simple case to a triangle, but of course you can extend it to any sensitivity. You know, we can think about cognitive sensitivity. If somebody, you know, has problem reading, there will be a problem in, in, the, in the connectivity here. So basically all the a priori information, the biases, the hypersensitivity or undersensitivity of the cortex, we, are, we expect it to be happening in this synaptic connection. 
if you want to plot the, this phenomenon of the Hebbian learning in a more quantitative manner, you can use a simple scatter plot where on this axis what you plot is the amount of co-activation of the two neurons during the training. So for example, if we plot this synapse, the, these two neurons were co-activated a lot during the training, so they will be to the right on this axis. And the, because of the Hebbian rule, we expect them to have an increase in the synaptic strength. So if you compare the synaptic strength after training with that that occurred before training, you expect this uh, synapse to be high to the right. Okay? Conversely, you expect the synapse that was deteriorating to be left. It was uh, maybe anti-correlated or decorrelated from the target neuron, and consequently we expect the strength of the synapse to be reduced. Therefore, you'll see uh, this point on the left. And overall, you expect some kind of a cloud if you map all the synapses. And in this scheme, you expect some kind of a linear cloud to be presented that will reflect the fact that this system underwent a Hebian, we call it Hebian training or Hebian sharpening under the training. I hope this is all very trivial and very basic. I just wanted to make, make it you know, in orderly fashion. Now, how, how can we map, why do I claim that we map this synaptic efficacy by the spontaneous or resting state activity? Here is the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that if you block the visual input, what happens is that internal noise in the system that exists there all the time, and I'm not, maybe at the end, if we have time, we can discuss why there should be internal noise or what function it might have I will not discuss it, but just let's assume that there is a random noise that is shaking the system, that is simply bombarding randomly and equally all the elements in this network. Now, I think intuitively, without any quantitative modeling, it becomes clear that because the synapses here are strong and positive, you will see in the random fluctuation of the system gradually the emergence of correlations between these neurons and the target neuron and you'll see an emergent anti-correlation or weaker correlation between this neuron and that neuron. Because, for example, consider the possibility that these three neurons, by chance, are firing together. As a result of the synapses, this neuron will also activate, so you will create a correlation between the firing simply by chance. By random shaking of the network, you will reveal an increase in correlation between this set of neurons, a reduction in correlation in this set of neurons. So if we assume that the network is bombarded by random noise that is equal on all parts, just by the mere fact of the synaptic efficacies, it should reveal a structure in the spontaneous activity that reflects the synaptic connectivity. So the, what I'm trying to suggest is that is exactly what we are seeing when we are seeing the resting state activity of the cortex when subjects close their eyes and we see the visual system being activated we see the pattern of spontaneous activity which reflects the synaptic structure within the cortex. This is the hypothesis. So just to give a metaphor, I thought it occurred to me that this kind of noisy pattern that is revealing the underlying pattern in the cortex is a little bit similar, or it's a good metaphor to think about, like this children game where you have a coin, you cover it with a page, and you scribble noisy lines on it, and gradually you see the shape of the coin coming out, not because you drew something particular, but because the random noise that you are introduced by these lines is gradually exposing the underlying shapes that are within the, the system. So the same way I'm thinking that the random noise of the cortex is exposing the shape of the synaptic connections in the cortex, and we can measure it with fMRI and other techniques. So... Considering this hypothesis, we were wondering what kind of predictions we can think about that are related to this hypothesis that can be actually tested in the lab. Okay, this is a hypothesis, but why should we believe it? And we, we thought about three hypotheses, uh, three predictions. One is the, related to this training thing. You expect the pattern of connections that you see in the spontaneous activity to reflect the average training that you go through when you run your daily life. 
So whatever you do in your daily life, the pictures that you see, the faces you see, the sounds you see, are constantly activating the brain in a particular pattern. And the average of that we expect to be reflected in the spontaneous activity of the cortex that you are mapping when you are looking at it with fMRI and other techniques. So we expect the resting state patterns to reflect what happens, the average of what happens to your cortex in terms of co-activation of networks as you run through your daily life. Okay, so this is uh, one of a very basic uh, prediction. The second prediction relates to a question, the question that Natalia asked, whether, what about individual differences? Now, following what I said, if two individuals have very, very different patterns of activations of their cortex, maybe because of lifestyle, maybe because of individuality, and of course the most important practically and interesting one is because of abnormalities, if they have very different patterns of activation of the cortex, we expect to see these differences in their spontaneous resting state activity. So, for example, if somebody is dyslectic and has a problem in converting visual images to language processes and so forth, we would expect this abnormality to be reflected during daily life in this problem of reading, but also when we ask this person to close their eyes lie in the magnet, and we simply measure their uh, spontaneous fluctuation. And the third uh, uh, prediction is that if we, under control condition in the laboratory, activate particular network in the brain, we simply force the cortex to be activated in a particular pattern, we would expect this pattern to be reflected later on in the pattern of spontaneous activity that we see in the subject that we measure, not only we expect to see it, we expect it to follow a Hebbian learning rule if we assume that this is the way things are done. So if we impose under control condition a focal activation of the cortex, we expect the spontaneous activity to rearrange itself to reflect this activation. So these are the three predictions. And if I have time, I'll touch on three of them. If not, I'll touch on only on few. I will actually start with the third prediction, which I think to me is the most challenging for, for the concept of the spontaneous correlations. And again, the, the prediction is that spontaneous correlations should be modifiable by training. Okay. What do you think you are, what do you to be modifiable by training? Say it again. Well, I was taught that the cortex, the adult cortex, it's very difficult to modify the connectivity by training. You know, people argue that maybe the hippocampus can be modified, maybe memory areas can be modified, maybe some motor learning, but I'm indeed proposing a very, very broad hypothesis that the cortex is very dynamic, it is modified all the time, and it is modified in a Hebbian manner. If you say, I knew it all along and it's not surprising, then... And not only that, that it's modifiable, no, the, the critical point here, not only that it is modifiable, but you can see this modifiability reflected in the spontaneous activity of the brain that you measure when somebody is relaxing and not doing anything. So we have a window into looking what happened in the, in the brain as a result of training, for example. But let's see the data and, and judge for yourself. So... Uh, <clears throat> so, together with Talar Melech and Son Preminger, we decided to try an experiment where we actually try to activate or train the cortex for a short period, for half an hour, very, very intensively, and see whether it will affect the spontaneous activity. And we chose, actually this was uh, driven by sort of a motivation for potential therapeutic future uh, possibilities, we chose the frontal cortex, the anterior cingulate uh, cortex, which is an area of the brain that is involved with decision making, initi initiation, taking uh, initiatives and so forth, and it is a, a particularly sensitive area in uh, old age, in schizophrenia, in different pathologies, where you have people that become very apathetic, very uh, not moving, not deciding, so we decided, just with a view to the future, maybe to see if we can train this area, change it, and uh, you know, in the future it might be, um, might be interesting for some kind of therapeutic aspect. Now the way, the problem with anterior cingulate, it's not easy to activate it. 
because it is part of the system that is self-generating, you know, it's part of decision-making, so it's very difficult from outside to, to cause strong and controlled activation. But we hit on the idea to use a new technique that we developed, uh, many, several labs developed, but also you know, we implemented in our lab, which is called fMRI neurofeedback approach. And the idea is very simple. We are now able to analyze fMRI signals so fast that we can do it literally in real time. So we can pick the, the, the anterior singlet region, for example, in a particular subject, take the signal from this subject while they are in the magnet, translate it to a tone, or if you want to a visual image, in our case it was a tone, and feed back to the subject the tone that corresponds to the amount of, of activity in the anterior singlet. And then you tell them, try to make this tone as high as possible when we want to activate it. And when we ask them to rest, we say, just relax. Okay? So the experiment was subject lying in the magnet. We feed them the sound of their own anterior singlet working. We give them a clue, a beginning strategy, how to do it, because we know this is decision-making area. So we said, try to think of scenarios where we're making a lot of decisions. And then they tailor their strategy according to the sound that they hear to maximize it. Okay? So we say it again. We tried visual stimulus for this kind of thing. It was not, not so successful. An auditory stimulus with the eyes closed was much better for this activation. Yeah, okay. I mean, the neurofeedback wasn't really necessary. You could just use the auditory stimulus. Yeah. Okay. In, in for the anterior singlet or in general? In general, I'll talk about it. It turned out that it's not necessary. But for the anterior singlet, it was. Uh, so I just want to show you an example of how such an experiment goes. Um, I brought this. This did not exist for the subject. I brought it because sometimes the, the speakers don't work well So for the audience to see when the subject got the instruction to increase the signal and when they got the instruction to, to relax. This is the target region. From this region, we picked up the fMRI signal. And what you'll see, you'll see the signal activity. I hope you can see it here. You'll see the signal activation of the cortex. You'll see the network activation in the cortex. And you will hear the tones that indicated to the subject how successful they were in, in activating this area or not. Okay, let's see if it will work. These tones are corresponding to the Activity level in the anterior singlet. Now I am accelerating it, so you, before you fall asleep. Does this signal represent the absolute bold signal or the amount of oscillations in the bold signal? The amount of uh, change, absolute, relative to the pre-condition. Uh, so there's a sliding window. Not the amount of oscillation. No, 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 there's no oscillation. The fMRI is very sluggish. It never oscillates. Yes. No, it was... Ah, but you see, well, I'll show you. You see that it's not the entire brain that is active. That's the critical point, and you'll see the map pretty soon. So uh, the subject activate the anterior singlet, yes? Speak louder, I don't hear you. 
The words were quite similar. One was, you heard, uh, increase and one was relax. So, and I don't hear you. Yes, but uh, this was very long time. I mean, the, the, the word is, you know, a second, and then there were, I think, 20 seconds of keeping the activity high. You never see such a long response. Hmm? I can't hear, but I assume what you are saying. We, of course, studied the auditory responses for a long time. If you, show, you present one word, you get a blip of about a few seconds, let's say three seconds, four seconds, a blip of response. Here you see a maintained activity for 20, 30 seconds. It's uh, unrealistic that it's respond. And we don't see such differences between increase and decrease in the auditory cortex like you see here. You never see such a... Not in that pure cingulate. Uh, not even in auditory cortex. So we succeeded in activating the, the anterior cingulate uh, for 30 minutes. Subject went up and down. I'll show you uh, the result uh, of the activation later. So the entire experiment is actually very simple. We measure the resting state or the spontaneous activity. In other words, subject line the magnet, close their eyes, relax. Then they are asked to undergo this training. Then they, again, close their eyes, relax, and we measure the spontaneous activity again. And then they go home. They come a day later, day two, and we measure the resting state again, a day after the training. This is the training in 30 seconds, actually 40 seconds, not 20, of activation. So the world is here, but the activity is for 40 seconds. It's unrealistic that it responds just to the world. Uh, then rest and activity and rest and so forth. Now this is to the question, maybe the entire brain went up with the, with the neurofeedback. This actually shows you how the brain reacted during the neurofeedback. First of all, you see this an uh, example of the, of the actual bold fMRI during the neurofeedback. You see subjects were quite successful in making the signal high when they were doing the neurofeedback and lowering it when they were not doing. And if you look at the map, the regions you see in, in orange are regions that were activated by the neurofeed during the neurofeedback. The target is this. And you see it as expected that it where it became very orange, meaning that it was activated nicely according to the protocol of the neurofeedback. But critically, there were many other regions in the brain, in the cortex, that were also co-activated with the target uh, ROI. And conversely, even more areas were suppressed. You see this antagonistic effect in the auditory cortex, for example. Um, there seems to be, when you're doing a very focal sort of activity, you, you tend to see often in the cortex antagonistic relationship between large networks. So one network will go up and the other one will go down. So in fact, these blue regions were anti-correlated to the neurofeedback protocol. If you think from the Hebian concept that I told you, you expect that the connectivity between the orange regions will increase and the connectivity between the target and the uh, blue regions will decrease. This is a prediction from the Hebian learning. Yes. I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> what I see is I see co-activation of this region. That's all I care. Yeah. I don't know what, how it was happening. I don't care. I just want to see these regions going together under these conditions. And I see it uh, during a neurofeedback protocol. That's, that's all I can say. Yeah. The subject reported that they tried to do decision making and all that. And the more they did it, the more successful uh, they were. Maybe I'll continue if you have more questions at the end. That's it. What, what do you mean by local? It's local only in the sense, not local at the level of a single neuron. Of course, yeah, I don't know. It's not local at all. There is a network. I mean, the, obviously, I mean, the whole point here is that it's not local. It's happening over a series of network, but it is not all over the brain in a uniform manner. I think that was the question that was asked. Maybe the entire brain goes up. That's not the case. Some regions go together with the neurofeedback. And some regions go in the opposite direction. That's all we know right now. And why is 
We the region the ROI was uh, the the left right. only left single left not right, just, not right, just left. Well, that's for technical reasons. We could we didn't we just chose left and that's it. I mean you know, we could do many things but that's what we did. Okay. Yes. <laughs> no, actually I like the question. Yeah. Uh, we played with different durations, and in fact, I think trying to maintain it for very long periods uh, was more <laughs> difficult. It's an effort. It's an effort, or effortful cognitive task to make decisions all the time. You run out of ideas, so it could be that uh, that's... Uh, the subject isn't able to tell you what he's thinking about and what he's actually... He is, he is. We're asking them. In fact, you have reports, but they reported that they feel that they control the tone. They report that they thought about themselves. Okay, but they can report when we are very careful, and it will turn out to be careful later on uh, what they what they think. So, was there a training effect in spontaneous activity? So, I want to uh, refresh your uh, memory about how you map Hebbian learning. What you plot is a scatter plot. What we did, we took for every voxel in the cortex of each individual, <coughs> we asked two questions. To what extent this voxel, let's say this voxel here, to what extent it was co-activated during the neurofeedback with the target ROI? We plot this co-activation level here on this axis. So voxels of the orange variety will be in this region, and voxels of the blue variety will be in this region because they are anti-correlated with the ROI. So on this axis we plot the co-activation or co-deactivation of every voxel in the cortex with the target ROI. This is this axis. And on this axis, what we plot is the change in connectivity between, these two, between each of these voxels and the ROI be, uh, after a day after the training compared to before training. What was the delta in the correlation level in the amount of co-activation during rest, not during training, during rest, in the rest before the training, with the rest a day after, when the subject went home, slept, and came back, we compared uh, how much change was in this correlation. If it was a positive increase, if the correlation became higher, it will be here. And if the correlation will be lower, it will be here. And I remind you, the prediction of a Hebbian training is that we should have a cloud that looks like that. So I want to show you a result from one individual. And this is the result we got. And you see we got a nice cloud that is very, very significant uh, correlation um, in the, this specific subject. And I remind you, those voxels here were co-activate during training and they increased their uh, correlation level in the resting state after the training compared to previous. Those voxels were anti-correlated and they decreased. And they all line up nicely on a linear cloud indicating a Hebbian type learning or sharpening of the correlation. So you say, okay, you brought us one subject, of course, carefully picked to be the best, and in fact, it's one of the best. So the question is how, yes? What is the correlation between, if you just take two spontaneous, two spontaneous sessions without anything in between, what's the counter of correlation coefficient in the two sessions? Average around zero, of course, and uh, well, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, we, I don't know, but it will be the average will be around zero. Ah, we actually have a control. I'll show you something that will answer this question through the data, not by uh, kind of theoretical. So this is one subject, and you'll say, okay, you know, by chance. So I'll show you all 20 subjects that participated in the study. Each one of these frames is a subject. And I have to tell you, I'm working in fMRI for many, many years. I never saw a result that is reproducible in each and every subject. The first time I saw it, I said, there must be a bug here. And here I'm actually presenting it to your smart, critical mind and try to find what could be the bug. But let me show you more data before 
uh, before the criticism because some of the controls that we did might answer your reason. But this is a very, very consistent result. Every single of these frames, individual subjects, was, uh, showed the, uh, this kind of cloud in the positive direction in a significant manner. And, uh, uh, and this, of course, if it is a true, and there's no bug here that I still cannot find, uh, this means that we could plot individual subjects uh, and find out in what way they are different. Because remember, this group of subjects are different from all the population of average subjects by the fact that they were trained with neurofeedback on the, on the, on the anterior cingulate. So we can see it in individual subjects. Now, the, I'll tell you immediately a possible artifact here, immediately. Put it right on the table. If the subject lied in the magnet the day after and rehearsed in their minds the, the training that they did in the, in the fMRI, if they, for example, decided, ah, I'm back in the magnet, let me do again decision-making and all that, then we will get exactly that result. Okay, so if subject came back, and instead of just relaxing and thinking, you know, when am I going to go out, what am I doing for life, they said, okay, let's do again decision-making and all that, then we expect to get something like that, and I will not go and explaining it, but that's the expectation. But of course, as somebody asked here, um, <coughs> um, um, the, we can ask the subject, what did you do while you were resting? And they said different things. None of them said that they were doing the decision making, which is a very difficult task. Some of them said something interesting. We were doing some kind of mantra. In other words, they were either counting their breath or saying the same word again and again to pass the time or, or counting the sound of the magnet. All these are marked by asterisks. The ones that did what we call repetitive speech kind of, uh, kind of, uh, uh, strategy, and you see that there is no effect on the, on the cloud. It's not that the ones that for sure did not participate in rehearsing the training were all here, and the, the ones that did not are here, but it was scattered all over the place. Yes? We didn't study a week. This is we are doing right now in another experiment. We did only one day after. This is not an easy experiment. Yes. How what? Um, I find it hard to believe that within half an hour of simulation, the blood vessels will change. It's something we need to consider, but uh, but. Could be, yeah, something to consider. But I find it um, usually blood flow. Well, you yeah, could be, could be that it's related to the blood somehow. But uh, I measure the blood flow, but we never saw so far, despite the fact that we, we keep hearing all the time, this is just blood flow. Whenever people do electrophysiology of any kind together with fMRI, the result is always the same, and I said it in the first slide. To a first approximation, there is a tight coupling between the firing, the average firing within the voxel, and the fMRI. There is slight deviance that people might want to hang, hang on to, but this is the basic finding, yes? But speak loud. Do I increase what? The, the success of the neurofeedback? We didn't, surprisingly, we didn't find a strong improvement with time as subjects were doing it. We did it only once for half an hour. Okay, so this is the result. Uh, now, another thing that we noticed, that, and you see it here, that the amount of sharpening was not equal. Some subjects did it more robustly. You showed a, very, a, a higher correlation. And some, some subjects show weaker correlation. And the question, of course, was that maybe that was related to their success in the neurofeedback training. And indeed it is. This is the success of subject as measured by the magnitude of the activation during the training on this axis. And on this axis, it's simply the R value of the cloud of the Hebbian sharpening 
And you see it's not perfect, but there is a significant correlation. So those subjects that were very successful in the training also showed a stronger um, neurofeedback um, effect, um, sharpening effect uh, afterwards. Now, maybe that will answer Ellie's question. It, you could argue that there's some bug in the mathematics, in the blood flow. Maybe the entire brain is gradually becoming more sharpened and more sharpened. So just as a control, we picked up a region of interest that was of equal magnitude to the anterior cingulate but was in a sort of gray area. We, of course, saw the map, so we could choose the area we want. And we did repeated exactly the same analysis of correlation during the neurofeedback with the increase in uh, synaptic uh, correlation on this uh, control area. And you see that the cloud disappeared. So it's not some kind of a global brain effect that happens, but it uh, seems to be localized to the trained target. Well, I have it here. No, no, no. I mean, yeah, this, this is college. But you wanted to have no conditioning on another group of subjects, let's say, and compare the correlation between the specific, uh, the same... Uh, uh, With what? What will be... What will I put on the axis? You, you would put the same number, but they ah. Another way to, to look for effects, we actually studied it before in schizophrenic patients, is to ask a very simple question, not this heavy and complicated question, but ask something very simple. You simply calculate each voxel in the brain. And it does not have to be, and the beauty of it, it's data-driven. You don't know, you don't assume that you know where the training was. You pick up every voxel in the brain, and you ask in the two resting state, how much each voxel was connected to the rest of the cortex. Okay, we call it global index. To what extent each voxel show what was the average correlation of each voxel with the rest of the cortex. Okay, so you go voxel after voxel after voxel. You build up a map of the global connectivity of each voxel with the rest of the cortex. And you subtract, subtract this global connectivity after the training from that that was happening be before the training. And what we find is this green patch that seems to fit nicely with the training target. Remember, here we did not assume that we know what the training was. We just went voxel by voxel in a data-driven way. And this region actually showed reduced global connectivity, which you might say, wait a minute, but you train this area. It should be increased. Our inter First of all, this is the data. And our interpretation is that because there were more regions that were deactivated during the the training as compared to activated globally when you average across the entire cortex they deactivated are winning and are showing this decrease in global connectivity precisely where the training was but i think it shows us at least that there is a reorganization of the resting state following the training maybe it's not related to the hebian but the nice thing about this result is that we did not assume anything and we got the training focus coming at us in a data-driven manner. Okay. Yes. You showed the data, you compared the pre-training with the day after. What about the Italy after the training? Surprisingly, it was weaker than the day after. So we saw consolidation, many possibilities. One of the reviewers wanted to know if they went to sleep and all these kind of issues with sleep. It could be that simply the subject were tired and that somehow might affect it. We don't know. It's, it's one of the future things to check. There's obvious follow-up questions, or you might say needs for controls, and I listed the ones that we thought about. Um, first of all, is it happening only in the frontal cortex? Somebody asked whether you need neurofeedback. Uh, is it only in frontal cortex, or maybe it is a general cortical phenomenon? Happens everywhere. The second question, do you need neurofeedback? This question was asked, or maybe just activating the cortex in any other way will also give you this kind of heavy and sharpening. Does it reflect some kind of re-engagement with the, with, the, with the training? So you say maybe the subjects are not uh, you know, rehearsing in their mind 
the training, but maybe somebody asked me, some cognitive psychologist asked me, maybe subconsciously, the fact that they are placed in the magnet, which was the place where they were trained, is call, causing some conditional response that they are not aware of. They are, not, they are thinking they are doing the mantra, but subconsciously they are doing training because they are reenacting the context of being in the magnet. And, of course, the most important thing, as far as I'm concerned, is does this whole business reflect any changes in the cognitive uh, characteristics of the subject? Does it do these changes in connectivity that I show you with the resting state? Does it mean anything in terms of cognition? So all these questions we decided to address in a second experiment. This is preliminary result, as I said. So uh, I'm waiting. I'm, I'm would be happy to hear crit criticism. And because, you know, my lab is a visual <coughs> mapping lab, we decided now to work on the visual system. And we decided to selectively activate a well-known cortical area. It calls the parhippocampus place area. We studied it, for example, in movies. It is very sensitive to images of architectonic landmarks, of buildings, uh, topographic landmarks, and so forth. And it is very different from a neighboring area that is sensitive to faces. So we decided to selectively activate the power hippocampus place area and see whether we can get, again, a change in the spontaneous activity that is related to this training. The experiment is heroic, uh, very complicated. Uh, I'll just give you a feel of it. Um, before we start the training, we do a whole battery of tests. The usual rest that you saw before, we now increase it to eight minutes, eight minutes to get better statistics. Then this is a critical experiment, as far as I'm concerned. In this experiment, we picked up a strategy, a task for the subject that does not activate the visual system. It is a simple tone count. The subject lies in the magnet for eight minutes, and occasionally we play a tone to the subject. It could be either a high tone or a low tone. The subject task is simply to count how many high tones he or she heard during the scan for eight minutes. So they have to keep in mind the numbers. They have to listen to the tones. And this is frequent enough that we hope it will prevent them. We at least will control their cognitive state. So you could not argue where they are resting. Maybe they are thinking about the training. Maybe they are doing something like that. So we are not talking about rest anymore. This is task. But the task was chosen not to, as much as possible, not to interfere with the visual system. Then we do anatomical uh, studies. We are not talk, going to talk about it. And then we are doing a behavioral test, backward masking detection test. This is something we did in the lab. I'll show you an example of it. How, I'm, I'm running out of time, I assume. So I should... How much? Five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay. So I'll just show you a little bit of the activation. This is how the training look, looks like. The task of the subject, sometimes these building pictures appeared for twice the duration that they typically, and the subject task was to detect those and press a button. And, uh, you know, it looks trivial. You just see buildings and all that. You say, wow, this will change the brain. But they did it for half an hour. I'll show you in you know, a few seconds. But for half an hour, you sit and watch these buildings coming again and again and again. And apparently... And we chose half an hour simply because the neural feedback was half an hour, ready to extend it to two hours if needed, but it turned out to work with half an hour, so we stopped there. And the result, I'll go quickly, is exactly the same as we got to with, the, with the frontal cortex. We see a very nice cloud. I will not show you now the clouds. I'll just show you the, the, the heavy and sharpening effect. In each individual subject, we see the effect. And critically for us, at least for me, because I keep being criticized, what do you know this rest activity? Like somebody said, maybe they're listening to, the, to that. Maybe they're thinking. How do you know? Uncontrolled experiment, impossible. So now we have control experiment. We have tone count. Subjects are doing something very consistent. And the effect is there. The effect is just there. Um, and repeated in each individual subject, we see it. Preliminary, we don't have all the control, but this is already uh, showing that something is happening. And also, you can train outside of the magnet in order to break this contextual link. So we train the subject outside of the magnet. 
after all the rest was taken, we mapped the network of houses by showing them the training after everything was measured, after the rest was measured. We showed them the training again to get a feel for the connectivity and which parts are activated together during training, and we got, again, the same result. So this means there's no some kind of uh, reinstatement of the, con of, of the cognitive state. Is it, a f is it related to performance? We ran the backward masking, and the task of the subject was very simple to say, if they see a face, try to do it yourself. If they see a face, a house, or a mask, and uh, just sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. I'm very slow at this advanced age, so. But, uh, but uh, we, yeah, we plotted the, the behavior. Very preliminary, don't jump on it. We have many more subjects. But already, I think, it shows that there is some trend. The more sharpening there is, the better the performance is for houses. And what's encouraging, there is something almost inverted for faces. Very preliminary. I would not call that a real result yet, but it's in the right direction. And I think I'll stop here. I, I brought some more stuff, but uh, obviously the questions. Let me just go. Uh, so just a summary, if I can get there. OK. So basically, the story to start with is that, in fact, there are two types of cortical signaling. The one we all study with single unit, you know, we are familiar with, is this, the signal that happens when you stimulate the subject with a visual stimulation, with auditory stimulation, with some cognitive task. It's a burst of high firing that is very fast and very transient. Then the other task, and this very intense activation, is leading to heavy and sharpening. And my view, following what I said to Merav, is that maybe we underestimated, maybe have people knew it ahead, I was underestimating the cortex flexibility and dynamic changes. It seems that everywhere you are activating very strongly, it changes. And maybe the reason we see the cortex so consistently is not because it's not dynamic, but because our life is very monotonous. You know, we do, we do on average the same things. That's why the cortex remains the same. But this kind of data shows that it can be modifiable in a very, very intense short periods if you do this kind of task-induced activation. Then we have the other kind of signaling. I'm not, we don't know yet whether the cortex is toggling between these phenomena of rest versus task activation. The other type of signaling is low firing, very, very slow waves of activity. We call them ultra slow. It reflects, all I can say now that it reflects prior cortical activation. This is what I spent all the talk on. We also have evidence that it, in the, it reflects abnormalities, abnormalities in the cortex. So if you have somebody that you can show that the visual system is not working properly, you find the same in abnormal behavior also in the resting state connectivity. We showed that it um, persists over days, like I said, at least one day after uh, the effect. And it reflects sort of the common activation of the cortex. For example, when you watch a movie, you look which networks come up when you watch a movie, and then uh, during sleep, by the way, I didn't talk about it, but sleep seems to be very similar to the rest. You see these same networks coming up again in a very significant way. So these networks also appear to be similar to what we tend to activate during our daily life to the extent that movies sort of reflect the average activation that we see in the sensory system. So these findings, of course, don't prove my hypothesis, but I think they are compatible with it. And if they are compatible, and if resting state or spontaneous activity mapping tells us something about the unique a priori information individual, we have a very, very powerful tool here to really study the individuality of the person. You know, what are the biases that one person has relative to the other? What abnormalities? What are expertise? They all should be reflected in changes in their resting state. Um, just the open questions, I'll say. Um, <clears throat> what is the function? I didn't talk about what function could it be. There are many theories. Some say that it is prepares you for action, for, for switching quickly to the task activation. Other possibilities that it is simply there to maintain the synaptic connectivity. 
Others might tie to creativity. Maybe it creates new solutions when you don't have them. We are in the dark regarding this question. Are we aware of the signals? I showed you that they happen when you are doing another task. But if you focus your attention, can you sense that these signals happen in your brain? We have some data on it, but I will not touch on it. And, you know, an interesting possibility is it related to hallucinations. You know, you have this phenomena of tinnitus, like ringing in the ears, or bonnet, uh, hallucinations, visual hallucinations, when you have problems with your eyes, or phantom pain. Maybe the system, when you deprive it of input, becomes so sensitive that it starts to be activated so strongly to the internal noise that it starts generating hallucinations. These are all thoughts for the future. And just to summarize, it, sort of to give you a, a picture for the history of this thing, the idea that spontaneous noise can be used to reflect the characteristics of individuals is an old idea in psychology, and it's called the Rorschach test. Basically, the Rorschach test, if you think about it, is bombarding the individual with noisy stimuli, and from the response of this individual to noise, you get it, their biases, sensitivities, and so forth, what I'm trying to propose here is the brain is doing a self-administration of Rorschach tests by creating this noise that reflects the underlying correlation structure in the cortex, and uh, this is an, uh, an idea for the future. So thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much. We have uh, time for a question or two, so... Yes. Yeah. So... so uh, I still don't understand uh, if the decision process. Uh, every person was deciding what, can you give us an example of a decision process that the person was thinking about? Sure, this was all students. Right. And the first strategy we told them, you have uh, experiments to design and decide what kind of stages you, there will be in the experiment. And the students relate to it very well. You know, they have a project, they need to think about different projects. And they had to decide. And as they do it, they hear the tone increasing. Now, if they, they try to do it faster, they hear the noise increasing more. They try to think about other you know, things that are not decision, the noise goes down. So gradually, very quickly, it turns out, they learn how to, to create this signal. You can do it, by the way, in many other conditions. You can do it in the visual imagery and so forth. In this case, we used it for... Uh, for so everybody was doing a different decision. Not very. In, in general, properties, they were the same, but the, the specific were very different. If he's going, uh, for a yeah, yeah, yeah. In that sense, they were the same. Yeah. So there was no common. Uh, no. I'm not sure if this is so much a question as an expression of wonder. Okay. But whatever decision that these people were making or mantras that they were uh, repeating looked like it was increasing the activity on one side. And, and with, without any effect at all on the other side. Why? At least for the picture you showed us, there was yellow on the one side and blue. No, no, we removed. This is the medial. Sorry, this was the medial uh, wall of the of the hemisphere. In order to see it, you have to, uh, you know, surgically or logarithmically remove an entire hemisphere so you'll be able to see the picture on the side. So You're talking about the demo. Yeah. The activation was on both sides. I actually showed in the so map. You do have do have activation on both sides. Of course. Uh, By the way, the, one of the, the first thing we notice about these networks, spontaneous activity, that they are connecting uh, homotopic regions in the two hemispheres. And this is very typical of cortical activation. There are some unilateral <coughs> cases, and it will be interesting to see if the resting state reflects that. That's uh, w another thing, possibility. For example, language is unilateral. So will the connectivity of the language area across the hemisphere will be less then for the visual system, we, we haven't looked at it, but it's very easy to look. Well, I said, the function of this in adult 
uh, spontaneous activity is unknown. My good friend at the Whiteman Institute, Menachem Segal, is growing neurons in tissue, and he showed me, first of all, that they constantly do this kind of uh, modulatory firing, and more interestingly, if you kill the firing by putting TTX on the, on the tissue culture, they all die. So it means that they must have this spontaneous activity in order to survive. That's one function that might be simply some kind of an, a must-do for the neurons to, to that generate this activity might be doing something else. It's very expensive metabolically. You know, these neurons are firing not very high, very slow, but still this, it's probably doing something important in the cortex. Thank you.